All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are here for the last session of the day, our executive thought leadership panel. Uh, my name's Austin Lacey, and uh, it's like I'm the opener for the opener before the main act, so uh, I I'm just have the uh, opportunity to introduce our uh, panel today of executive thought leadership, uh, sponsored by RapidScale. Uh, so if you join me on stage, uh, first we welcome John McKenna, uh, Chief Revenue Officer for RapidScale, uh, and your moderator for today's panel. Uh, you'll have Chuck Williams, Senior Vice President of IT at Penske, Grace Hansen, Vice President for Stellantis, Ben Rappin, Associate Vice President of IT and CTO for Grand Valley State University, and lastly, Ali Saeed, the Chief Information Security Officer for Amway. John? Thank you. How's everybody doing? All right. All right, let's uh, do a little survey here. Uh, by a, uh, how much noise can you make? How many Michigan State fans do we have here? Woo! How many Michigan Wolverine fans? Woo! How many Oregon Duck fans? How about Ohio State? <laughs> I don't know if I should tell you guys this before we get started, but I am from Columbus, Ohio, and you know, grew up rooting for Ohio State. Mm -hmm. But my daughter just moved to Detroit, Michigan. I got another daughter that's in Oregon. She's actually on the, uh, got a coaching job on the Oregon football team. So I was in Detroit last Saturday watching Ohio State play Penn State wearing an Oregon shirt and then <laughs> wearing an Oregon shirt in front of all these Michigan fans for the Oregon-Michigan game. So I don't know if that endears me to you guys or not, but I'm conflicted in a lot of ways, apparently. <laughs> so uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank uh, C3 for giving us the opportunity to sponsor this. Uh, had a lot of great conversations with the panelists leading up to us. I think we got a great group here and really excited for the conversation. So without further ado, Leadership in times of change. Um, AIML might be something that comes up every once in a while, but uh, you know, talking about just in general, I, I think we're we're always changing. But you know, I'll start with Chuck. Uh, you know, we're we're unnavigating an era of, of unprecedented change. I mean, we always go through change in technology, but what's the long-term implications of what's going on right now is a big deal. Uh, but what are the key qualities that leaders today need uh, to foster that resilience and adaptability? Uh, within their teams. Yeah, thank, thanks, John. I think, I think in a lot of ways, AI is just the latest technical re revolution that we've seen. You know, for those of you who might have gray hair like like I do, right? This isn't our first rodeo, and it seems like the same characteristics uh, apply here that they did in the past. Like uh, you obviously have to be an outstanding communicator and communicate often and and openly on what we're trying to accomplish and what the risks and opportunities are. I think you have, to, you have to foster an environment of trust, build an environment of trust. This is something that is table stakes for anybody who's, who's doing a good job leading a team. And uh, it'll pay dividends in times like these when people are asking a lot of questions about whether AI is going to, how, how AI is going to impact their job. Uh, I think uh, agility is important. You have, to, you have to be agile. And I think one way to do that is, again, by having a, an environment that People, people trust you in, uh, it gives them more, more um, willingness to take risks. And you know, obviously that's important because you have to sometimes tell them to, to pivot. And then obviously uh, ending you know, empathy. You have to understand like, what they're going through, what they're thinking about. Do they have a skill set that is looking backward, maybe not looking forward? And you know, how might they be feeling you know, with that? And, and, and more importantly, how can you help them? And Ben, I know, you know, Grand Valley State, higher ed's always, you know, seems to be a change in uh, a lot going on there, but how does that uh, work with, with your organization and your team? Well, I think people really want to be involved in the change, so I think being open and transparent with what you're doing really allows them to uh, come along. I think having a growth mindset, knowing that people can and will change with the right support is important. And I think you have to be a champion for that with training and development. Now, I think to the question of striking a balance. I think change and innovation can be disruptive or perceived to be disruptive. So I think you just have to intentionally focus on what's most uh, impactful and what's most strategic at any given time. And, and don't innovate and change for the sake of change. There's a lot of tools and solutions that are looking for a problem. And I think for leaders, it's important to really focus on the ones that are gonna make an impact. Yeah. Well, and. and Ali, I know, you know you've got an interesting role being in CISO. That's uh, tons of change in and of itself, but 
you know, how do leaders, how can they strike a balance between driving innovation and maintaining stability in times of rapid transformation? Because you've got that give and take responsibility and there's a lot going on that needs to happen, but obviously there's a lot at risk too. And the conversation we were having earlier, we talked about uh, how we got extended responsibility for our commerce platform, for our product build perspective. So now not only am I seeing the security aspect of it, but also from a product vision perspective, the implications of security on commerce. I think the most important thing in driving that balance is having a conversation about incremental change or incremental innovation. I know AI, Chuck mentioned, it's a tool, right? But everyone's looking for that disruptive change that this tool can initiate. And then overseeing from that context perspective the incremental benefit that we can have. So. Uh, in the pre previous panel, they talked about hackathons. This idea of test to learn, uh, experimentation is a mindset that allows for innovation to grow and, and grow roots, rather than it being a conversation where you're trying to basically pull, like a tug of war, right? From a security perspective, you're looking from how to protect the implications of it, but then you're stifling innovation. Innovation is what's gonna drive the business forward. So you gotta have that conversation of how do you allow for some bandwidth from a budget perspective, from a training and upskilling perspective, the ability for innovation to take place in an incremental fashion and not be gung-ho on finding that transformative thing, which realistically in the world of AI, like the unicorns are there, but there are unicorns for the sake of the fact that unicorns are not real, right? It's harder to find, but if we, tackle it from the perspective of incremental innovation, you basically drive forward uh, on the strategy of balancing those out and have a, a organization that's built on trust, your earlier point, right? Where they understand the outcome that they're trying to drive and the fact that the organization trusts the fact that we are in this together is, I would say, is kind of, to your point, the conversation we're having about balancing the security aspect that I have and the product aspect that I have is creating that space for innovation, incremental. Yeah, you've got the hardest job, right? We, we were joking about, you know, we've got our CISO that anytime somebody's like, oh, I'm gonna use this new tool, and he's like, wait, what? You know, and it has to go through that uh, process, but I think that's a very interesting perspective, and I think we'll come back to some of that uh, view a little bit later, too. Um, you know, so we're, we're talking, obviously, about, you know, AI and hype versus reality, and we were talking earlier, like, there's AI and uh, built into a lot of stuff that we're using already, uh, you know, Chuck, you've got a very interesting organization you're responsible for. Penske's got logistics, you've got online retail, and you've got finance. I mean, you, you know, uh, fleet services. Um, give us a feel of where you see your organization currently, uh, and, and what, where do you feel like you sit on that spectrum between hype and reality? Yeah, the, thanks. I think that, uh, well, you're right. We, we have a number of different businesses, and they're all, they all operate relatively independently. Uh, there's consistency in some of the things we're doing organically and uh, involves the use of things like Microsoft Copilot, you know, providing it to, to key users. And I think a, a good way to represent what we're doing is that uh, we're, we're leveraging these tools as the first pass of the draft. Like whenever we want to create something, we'll always have the AI do it as a draft, knowing that it's not anywhere near 100%, uh, but it gets you kind of that first step. Uh, very, very quickly. And um, that's something that we're doing universally. I think uh, uh, Go, uh, GitHub uh, Copilot is something else that we're using internally. And I think that's provided my team 20%-ish, you know, it, it, it varies, but you know, they say that it does help them, you know, just simply by reducing the number of, of uh, keystrokes. Uh, and I think looking more broadly or more, 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 um, uh, more, uh, um, what's the word we're not we're more innovatively uh, is that we're looking to utilize this technology to enable to basically power our call centers so uh, when you get a when you want to make a service appointment make a phone call uh, you might not be talking to a human and we've had some pretty good success in doing that with this kind of the simple I know, oil change or 50,000 mile service, you know, but the calls where you call in and says, my car is making a clunk, 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 clunk noise, right? That doesn't, we're not really quite there yet. So then we'll, we'll hand it off to a, to a live agent to, to finish the, the, you know, that call. Um, so uh, it, it varies, but I, I think that we as a company, uh, we're usually not on the cutting, we like to be fast followers. So, you know, a lot of times we're kind of paying close attention to what people are doing out there on the cutting edge and picking the things that make sense for us.
All right, well, you just brought it up, cutting edge. Uh, you know, so Ben, I'll, I'll hit you next, and I think everybody has something they wanted to weigh in on this, but uh, how do you manage the expectations uh, within your organization regarding AI's potential and impact? Because, you know, we talk about the hype and the capabilities, but, you know, what are those messages and strategies that uh, have helped your leadership gain a clear understanding of where you're heading and where you stand today? Yeah. yeah, inherent in that question, I often hear, why aren't we doing more? Or when, when are we going to turn it up to a 10 and really, really get this AI going? So at the university, on one hand, we're, we're still early days. We have a lot of foundational policy work that we need to finish. We need to do some governance work to really set us up for success long term. But on the other hand, we're really far ahead on leveraging what our partners are providing. So we look to, to Workday and to Adobe and to Microsoft and Zoom uh, to really get us further along. So when managing the expectations, I think it's important to acknowledge the breadth of what we're already doing and, and show that it's not a, a zero. We're not starting from scratch. And there's a lot of success and knowledge that can be gained in using those tools that are delivered for us to imagine what we could do in level two, three, four, and up. Yeah, thank you. And Ali, you've got a CISO role. Um, you seem to be very progressive around policy and how people are using it. But anything to add there with, with your side? I think. Uh, to the previous conversation we were having in terms of a security role, it's important to have governance, but then within that governance framework, allowing for innovation to fester and kind of allowing for the, some of that. Within Amway, we've kind of taken um, two aspects to AI specifically, right? So there's disruptive change or disruptive innovations that we can do, and then there's productivity. And being transparent and open about the fact of the capabilities that AI can and cannot do. In one of those disruptive use cases, I can't get the details of it, but like we're looking at translation and transcription as a component of compliance. Uh, we quickly learned we are in 80 plus countries. Translation and transcription of certain languages, the AI hasn't caught up, but the use case was built around compliance around those, all those aspects. So having those conversations with stakeholders on what is realistically possible and not is as an important conversation to make sure that the organization understands that we can get it to a 10, because mm -hmm. realistically, AI is not there yet. In every conversation that leaders, that all of our counterparts go to a conference, they kind of hear about all these shiny toys, they assume it's an easy step from zero to 10, mm -hmm. and it's not. It's still a journey. Um, Chat GPT came out a few years ago, and we're still working through some of the stuff. I joke about it, but like ChatGPT just now announced their ability to kind of do search as part of their thing. It's an ever-evolving space. But going back to the security question, I think for security leaders, it's creating a space where there are guardrails, where you have compliance policies from a responsible use of AI, but then creating a space for innovation to fester from within. I think is an important aspect that as we, we as technology leaders have to see this as an enabling capability for the next generation because they are living it and they're gonna come into the workforce expecting this to be there. So it's important for us as leaders to create that space in a secure um, governance framework from an accountability perspective. No, I, think that's, I think that's a really good point. And you know, we, you've touched on it, but people, Right? I mean, we're, we're talking about how AI ML is going to impact our companies and the way we do business and all that stuff, but it's having a huge impact on our teams. Mm -hmm. I just know the stricken look I get when I talk to some people about what they're, what they're trying to do or what they're trying to accomplish, it's hard. And, you know, Grace, I know you had a lot of things that you're doing. I think we were, a lot of us were taking notes on how are you doing that? Like, that's a really <laughs> good idea. But talk about the future of work, right? Like, you know, is all of this automation and AI become more integrated? You know, how are you equipping your teams with the skills they need to drive a more tech-centric and hybrid work environment, considering these new technologies that are going on? Yeah, that's excellent. We put a very strong focus on continuous learning in our organization. Um, we really do believe that curiosity is the spark that ignites the fire of innovation. It is asking those questions, and that's really what it means to be continuously learning. If you're asking questions, you're always learning about something new. So we've implemented a few different things in our organization to help to do that. Um, the first thing that we did, and we started this at the end of last year, is we introduced this idea of empowering our teams to have up to four hours each week for learning. Any topics that they wanted to, any choices. We gave suggestions, and we had people share out things that they were doing. 
And then this year we implemented a performance objective. So 15% of all IT employees, their performance is evaluated on their learning. And when I talk about that, it's not just, okay, did you do 40 hours of learning? Um, there's certain courseware that they, that they need to take. It's aligned to their job. It's aligned to their role. And then we asked for them to apply it. So they need to demonstrate how they've applied this learning, what was the business value that came out of it, and we want them, them to share it. Um, I think we all know it's something to, to read a book, to go for it, but then when you apply it, you really learn it. And then when you share it out with other people, that takes your learning to the next level. I, I think that's all on point. And, and Chuck, you, you mentioned earlier that, and I was a little bit surprised, but you said you've got full support from your leadership to invest in training and development. I don't know that that's pervasive. I know I've, you know, my career bundled a lot of training credits into sales because mm -hmm. the company doesn't want to spend money on that. But what have you done to build the environment so that you're getting that financial support and uh, uh, endorsement? Well, it's just it's just super important to the leadership, like all the way up to Roger Penske, right? They invest in his people. I mean, from from training to you know other things like catered lunch, for example, right? Something that we, that we get. So it's it's just it's just from the top to the bottom. He cares about us, and uh, he realizes that realizes that that's an investment uh, in his business. And um, it, you know, it, it's 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 usually not a huge number, so it's a little bit easier just put it in there. And you know, I'm I'm not having a discussion about it because it's doesn't rise to the level that merits a discussion. But uh, you know, but but. That's not the reason why. The reason why is because he considers it an investment, something that, that we need to continually do. But the hardest thing that I've got, it's my struggle, is just getting people to actually take the training, to actually take advantage of the opportunities. Right. Well, and yeah, actually, I guess that would be an interesting question, too. And Grace, you, you mentioned, but when you look at you know, all of our organizations, I think we have leaders that are going to be the first to learn and you know, try to figure out how to apply the new technology. And you've got the followers, and you've got maybe some, some folks that need pushed. But what, what are you guys seeing as like the, the percentages of how many of those people are need to be pulled along versus, you know, that are really driving the transformation within your organization? So this is the first year we've done this performance objective, but we started measuring. So around September, after summer, we saw about 50% of the organization had really started looking at the learning. And that's when I started to turn up the communication. So we started highlighting and focusing. We did a spotlight on people that were doing the learning. We put dashboards together that showed how different functions, where they were in their performance. It does a couple of things. One, it drives awareness for the leaders. Oh, I need to help my team know that they need to get this done. It is important. Um, need to make sure that they're making time for it. But it also shines a spotlight on those people who are doing a great job. I've always learned you need to give fame to people who are doing the behaviors that you would like to see. You don't want to shame somebody who's not doing it. And it's worked very well because once you start to highlight those people who are doing well, you give them the opportunity to talk at a town hall, um, to showcase what they've done. They, they learned something and how did they apply this to the business. And you can see the passion and the energy when they're talking about it in a video or in a live discussion. So the, the, the metrics that I had uh, it, it just at the beginning of this month, we were at almost 90%. And that's only a couple months. And so, and we're not talking, you know, a couple of hours. Um, it's definitely, it was, it was over 20 hours of work and then again applying it. So uh, I think that it's something that people start to recognize when they see other people doing it and they want to be on board with it. I was going to One thing I wanted to, add a build, go ahead. I wanted to build upon is that we, to your point, right, we're just starting to do lunch and learn. So it's not just about training you know, the technology team, but also educating the business leaders and, yeah. and folks in business roles about what, what AI and other emerging technologies can bring. So it's, we have it set up, it's, people have volunteered to lead these, so it's, uh, it's been a huge success. I was gonna bring up that same topic, but I wanted to double click one thing that Grace said. I think the gamification of training, because we all offer training programs to, through HR usually, or within our teams, the ability to spend some time but I think one of the two important things is the gamification of aspect was really cool um, that I might have to explore. But the other piece is how do you make it so that they actually see value in it and then they actually find space, right? So it's one thing for me to say, hey, I'm going to give you use four hours every week on this. But if their plate is full, that's a conversation as leaders we need to have to how to create space for them, right? And I think Lunch and Learn is a great example of how you can create that 
recursive thing. Um, so in our, our, when we had a return to campus situation uh, after COVID, we introduced once a month lunch and learns. All those vendors that are outside have some thoughts and some input uh, on thought leadership that they can contribute. Invite them in. They'll do it for free, right? So use those resources. So sometimes it doesn't have to be a monetary training. It could be just bringing in thought leaders from the vendor community just to come and speak, offer some pizza, offer some lunch. Or to Chuck's point, there are assets within our organization that have wealth of knowledge. Bring them into the conversation. Have them conduct a session. I think those are some of the things that aren't that hard to do, but sometimes we overlook. Yeah, I mean, that's where you're going to harvest some of your best ideas. It's going to come from somebody who never knew what ChatGPT was until you did a lunch and learn with them and said, hey, could I use that to do this? You know, that's where, that's where you're mining gold. Yeah, and then you should see the power of it when then somebody on your team starts talking about it. Right. Because mm -hmm. I know we've all been in that situation, right, where the person who's wearing, a, you know, some kind of a badge from outside of the company, a visitor badge, like they get more credibility than the other. But then all of a sudden when your team is the one that's presenting and they're presenting, you know, at a global tech conference or they're talking about things, that's when you start to recognize this is important. Mm -hmm. um, and don't underestimate the power of a leader talking about this. Um, our CDIO talks almost every week. He has a post in our, in our community or he's sending an email off or, or chatting in one of our program meetings and he's always highlighting the importance of the learning. Um, in any of our major initiatives, it's very important. People here, you're talking about it, that must be what's important and now I'm getting rewarded to do it through my performance objectives. It starts to change the culture. Mm -hmm. Ben, anything to add? I know you're not immune to all this. <laughs> no, not at all. And I think at an institution of higher ed, I mean, it's very key that we're, we're training students to do this work. And we can't forget that our, our staff also needs the work. So I think the piece that resonated from lunch for me was you know, how much we can put expectations out there, but if we're not creating space, like Ali said, it's really, really critical. And I know even if you create space, it's very easy to give that space up when a greater need comes. So I think that's when accountability comes to say, we gave you the opportunity, we gave you the expectations, we gave you the space, now we need you to come along on the journey with us. Yeah, when kind of shifting, we were starting to get into it, but yeah, you know, the change management. And you know, I think, you know, everybody deals with change. I don't know that anybody feels like they're great or comfortable with it at, you know, at scale. I think I read Who Moved My Cheese in 1999 or 2000. Mm. Um, you know, and, and it's obviously still a pretty good uh, reference, but, uh, you know, when you talk about building a culture of change readiness, and Grace, you talked about some of this, and I think you've done some other things, but like, what practices do you implement to build that culture where it's not only uh, adaptable to change as a group, but the people in your team see it as an opportunity for growth. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. And, and it doesn't matter who you are. Uh, my title, I'm, I'm responsible for change capability, so I'm responsible for change. And, and yet it's still people on my team, sometimes myself, you still struggle with change. It's, it's something that is always, um, you can enjoy it, you can appreciate it, but it is always hard. I think the, uh, when you're starting to try to drive a change, you have to make sure that people understand the why. Um, so I'm sure probably most of the people in this room have heard Simon Sinek talk about the golden circle and, and talk about why and the science behind it, and it really works. If you can tell people what's in it for them, what's in it for me, why do I want to do this? You can share with them how they want to do it. So let's take the example of somebody changing and, and learning new skills. We focus on upskilling and reskilling, and we talk about what's in it for them. Why do I need to go and do this learning? What's in it for me if I go do this learning? Okay, we have the performance objective, that's one part, but you really want it to be intrinsic. That's the goal is you get for it to people just want to do it, not because you're paying me to do it. And, and so when you show people, you know, showcase people who have tried it, who have taken that first step or second step, and then they're in a new role, and you start having them tell their story about how 20 years ago they started doing COBOL program, programming on the mainframe, and they had those green screens that they saw, and they heard about this reskilling program and they started taking some learning. And the next thing, and now you know what they're doing, they're doing Power BI dashboards and they're doing data analysis. And, it's, and they're talking about how they're really transforming in what they're doing and what it means to them. It really helps to get people to see there is value and that's just in learning. Um, but you can, you can look at it whether you want to simplify in your organization. It's about how, highlighting why are you doing it, what's in it for me, what's the benefit, and then people can get behind it. 
I was going to add, like, I mean, Chuck talked about trust, but I think to your point, communication, 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 and some more mm -hmm. communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. what we as humans sometimes miss is the fact that not everyone hears it the first time or the second time and comprehends it. Um, so to build that change and growth mindset, it's about first building trust that they understand where you're coming from and the way you're communicating said change is from the right context so that they, are, they trust you. But two, on, to your point, explaining the why has to be something that's communicated and articulated multiple times so that it's, it resonates with people so they understand the underlying piece which then allows them to have a growth mindset to say, okay, now I understand. I'm guilty of this in terms of when we're in senior leadership, we have discussions, strategies that we build over multiple months, yet when we communicate, it's a memo that goes out. Oh. If we don't go do a good job of doing road shows to articulate the why behind it that we went through over multiple months, it's, we can't expect that to take root. And I think it's easy to fall into the trap of change can be fatiguing because our communication is often talking at people. We're telling them the why repetitively. Here's the why, here's the why. But if we can step back and include them in the formation of the why and, and from the very beginning actually include them into, you know, come, come share your story so you have some ownership in that why, it's very hard for them to disregard it. And it also makes them a champion. Then they're out telling the why with you and not walking out of the room saying, oh, we just heard that for the fifth time. It's not Grace talking about it or the people on her team. Yeah. It's all of a sudden the entire organization talking about it. Right. The, the other thing I would just add on to that, just to build one more point that's important, the why in it isn't the same for everybody. Mm -hmm. The why that works for me isn't the same why that's going to work for John, right? And it's not the same why that will work for the organization and the company. In order for people to really believe that you mean it, you need to tell them what's in it for them personally, mm -hmm. what's in it for your organization, and then what's in it for your company, because then they believe you. They don't think you're just saying something to them that you might change your mind about. Well, and can you, can you do too much that you, know, that you impact your stability of your organization? I guess, you know, Ali, you had some comments or thoughts about this, but what do you do to make sure that you're doing it in a way that everybody is brought along so it's not entirely disruptive to the organization, even though it's going to, you know, cause some waves and ripples and people are going to uh, struggle to adapt. I mean, I talked about it earlier, but like having this incremental mindset of innovation and disruption versus a, so sometimes we within technology struggle with, what was talked about in business case conversation in the prior, like building a business case that has it all figured out. We are in technology where things are evolving so fast that we don't even know what's going to happen in a month from now, yet alone two years from now, right? Three years is an eternity in, in the scale, in the speed of innovation that's taking place today. So I think it's important to kind of have that incremental mindset of having those tests and learned back to the security, but like with, with some guardrails in place. So you got to create some space for the playground where you could have that incremental innovation, but don't try and jump off. Take the first step, incrementally innovate on it, and build on those successes versus trying to go all in. Well, and that, that comes down to, we were talking about prioritization, mm -hmm. right? You got all these opportunities and options, but you know, with the pace of technical and market changes and how things shift so quickly, you know, how do you ensure that your organization remains agile and ready to reallocate resources as new challenges arise and as priorities might shift? Uh, Grace, I think you, you had some thoughts on this one too. Yeah, there's, there's a couple aspects on it. One is definitely about the agility of the people and how they're thinking, and that comes back to that continuous learning. Um, it was great this morning when we heard them talking about, you know, everything about AI and people, you know, it's you got to do it or your business is going to go out of business. You're not going to be here. And it said, well, we had the same conversation 10 years ago, 15 years ago about the cloud. Oh. It doesn't matter what it is. Today the topic is, is AI. Ten years ago we were talking about cloud. It's going to be something in two years. It's going to be something different. So we need to have that mindset to be able to be agile and change our focus on what we're learning and just continue to learn. Um, we've also implemented a framework that we use to prioritize our budgeting. And you know, we have six different dimensions, and every project that we bring forward for planning has to go through this prioritization matrix. You have this much money, here's where the line is drawn, and these are the top 10 projects that we're going to do. 
We talk about them on a regular basis. It's something where the leadership team is, everybody knows what those top 10s are. You're, you're all in agreement that these are the 10 that are gonna have the most value to the organization. They're going to drive the most simplification. It's going to really transform the way our employees experience something. The, uh, maybe it's gonna reduce risk that we have from an operation or security perspective. So there's these different dimensions and what we have found is that this takes the emotional aspect out of picking which projects go first. Because it's not like, oh gee, you know, Ben's projects always get picked and mm -hmm. mine don't. It's really about the, the data behind it and it's a decision that we make as a team. Yeah, if I can uh, I'll just add to that, I think there's a, there's a few different, I don't know if these are on your list of six, but you know, strategic alignment, yep. uh, ROI, right, just pure dollars, risk certainly, one, um, stakeholder alignment, like, you know, because you get, get people lined up and who's bought in and who's not. A lot of times that'll drive what projects get worked on because you want to go with, uh, it's almost like Congress, right? You got so many votes, you know, and you want to go with, uh, uh, with the one that's going to get the most votes. So, yeah, su super important. And I think even when you have the, the best plan, it's inevitable that change in priorities can, can shift. I think it's just important to remember that it still needs to go through that same process so that whatever is coming in to, to replace one of your existing projects or priorities, you can demonstrate that it is more impactful, more strategic exactly. than what it's replacing. And that helps with then explaining and communicating why that's happening. Because that taking somebody else's project off is equally impactful. Yeah. Well, guys, thank you. I do want to be respectful of our time. The one thing we didn't get to talk about was when life throws you a curveball and you have outside dynamics, but we can talk about that tonight. I know uh, each of you guys are going to be around uh, for the dinner tonight. Yep. So I, I know I learned a lot just talking through this whole uh, uh, panel discussion and getting prepared, but uh, hopefully you guys took away something too, and I uh, really look forward to continuing those conversations here this evening. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you. John.